when you talk about leadership lessons and things, uh, I've been really blessed to, to be around some pretty amazing leaders. And I try and grab a little bit from each one that I have the opportunity to meet with. And there's always some lesson that you can grab and say, wow, that's, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to hold on to that. I think the most important thing, we talk about things that I've learned that I apply to this. I go back to when I was 10 years old and I remember the head coach, our head coach, Mike, looking at coach JT Curtis, he's a legend in the football world and saying, JT, there's no way an 11 and a 12 year old is going to get this. It's too complicated. The reads are too tough. And JT looks at Mike and says, listen, you've got it all backwards. He said, what do you mean? He said, kids will rise to your expectations. If you expect them to make the read, they'll make the read. If you expect them to make the pitch, they'll make the pitch. You give them high expectations and they will rise to your expectations. Okay, everybody, I want to read right off of Rocket Town's website. The mission of Rocket Town is offering hope to the next generation through Christ's love. That's right on their website. The vision is to be the place of peace, purpose, and possibilities for youth. There's even a little description of the history. It says, founded by contemporary Christian music artist Michael W. Smith. Rocket Town of Middle Tennessee is a faith-based youth outreach facility in the heart of downtown Nashville. Rocket Town was founded in 1994 as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, a public benefit corporation. Now, who I have with me today is the guy who runs the show. He's the executive uh, director of Rocket Town. I've known Kenny for a while, Kenny Alonzo. Um, welcome to the show, and and thank you for taking the time to talking with me today. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Jim. I'm excited about this. Well, I got to tell you, um, from the last time I saw you, this whole beard thing is, yeah. <laughs> I, I know it's kind of, a, it's like an in thing now, isn't it? And uh, yes. you you wear it really nicely, you know, with thanks. you got the American flag ball cap on, you got the, the gray <laughs> beard, you, you, you're looking, you're looking stylish, man. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, my, my forehead's getting bigger, but you're just looking as handsome handsome as ever. Can I want to <laughs> I want to jump right in. Tell tell us your journey as far back as you want to go to becoming the executive director at at Rocket Town and we'll get into Rocket Town in a minute. Got it. So, uh, my background's been in youth ministry ever since I graduated from the university and I was in coaching and education but also in um, involved in leadership of a very large youth group in New Orleans, Louisiana where I'm from. And from that point, I moved out to North Carolina to help plant a church. Uh, my wife and I, we were youth pastors at a small church plant. And from that transition, uh, we were actually working for the YMCA at the time, both of us. Um, those That was our paying job, but the job that we're really passionate about was youth ministry. And transitioned from that to become an executive director of a small foundation in Durham, North Carolina that served the inner city. Uh, we actually had two buildings inside the public housing community. We did after school programs and uh, leadership clubs and things with youth. And so uh, it's interesting, My pretty much my entire career has been involved around serving youth in some capacity. Uh, moved here from North Carolina to Nashville, Tennessee, where we live now. We've lived here for 19 years and moved with a youth ministry uh, serving high school athletes mainly, and then uh, doing clubs on high school campuses all around Middle Tennessee. Did that for three years um, and uh, ended up through a series of events that uh, decided to go back into the YMCA. At the time, I thought it was to become the CEO of the YMCA of the USA and help bring the Y back to its Christian foundation. Uh, it's, I don't think it's any secret that it's straight a bit from what its original intent was. They do great work, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's not quite what it once was. And I thought that was my mission in life to, to get at a level where I could influence that. And uh, what it did was it built some things inside of me from a leadership perspective, from a business perspective. Um, I, at one point was over four locations. I was a vice president of a very large group of wise. 
and uh, was equipped for a CEO position, uh, was in the process of interviewing for a CEO position actually, and uh, down in Georgia, and was reached out by a friend who was a headhunter, and he was doing the executive search for Rocket Town, told me that this was my position, and I said, I'm not interested, and he basically called me or had someone, one of his staff people call me three times until I finally said, okay, I'll at least consider it. Um, it's not really the whole story, but, uh, you know, he, he said, you know, this is a door that's open from the Lord, walk through it until he closes it. Hmm. And, and then he dropped the come on brother. And I'm like, <laughs> like don't, don't brother me. Uh, this is not, and he's like, no, just promise me you'll pray about it. Huh. And I said, no. And he said, come on, just promise me you'll pray about it. And so I said, okay, I'll pray about it. Hmm. And I went home with no intention of praying about this position. I told my wife the story and she said, well, let's pray. And I said, honey, I don't, I don't need to pray. pray. I'm, I'm about to get this CEO job down in Georgia. We're going to get a big raise. We're going to live in a great house, great community, and, and life is good. And she said, you're a man of integrity. You said you would pray. We're going to pray. So we prayed. And uh, shortly after, she said, well, would the Lord tell you? And I said, well, you tell me first. And she <laughs> said, no, tell me what he told you. And I said, well, he said this was the beginning of the fulfillment of the word that you received when you were 18 years old from the pastor that came through your church. And uh, it, Jim, I believe I've told you the story. A, a internationally known minister was in our church and from the stage called me out and brought me up on the stage with my family and, and told me that he felt like the Lord had something special for me that I was called to full-time ministry and what God had called me to was significant. And so he said some other things, but when I prayed about it, the Lord said, this is the beginning of the fulfillment of the word you received when you were 18. Um, I knew I had to take this job. Now I hadn't even gone through the interview yet, but I knew it was going to be offered to me and I knew I would take it. And so here I am. Interesting. Um, and, and, you know, what, what you were talking about with YMCA, you know, we, we call that mission drift. It happens to the best of organizations, you know, for, for profit, non for profits, ministries, uh, 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 whatnot. And uh, I, I know it's always a challenge as a leader to, to uh, help everyone see that we're here to really serve the mission. And that's why it's so important that we, write accurate mission statements that we can point you know everyone to so i don't think it's a criticism i just think it's something that that happens that but that is a great story um of, of and it, if you think about it, it everything just has been aligned you know to get you in the spot that you are in today i had an hour with truett kathy one time when he was still the operating um uh, president of chick-fil-a and man, I, he, that was one of the most amazing, amazing opportunities I think I've ever had in my life. I sat there and just absorbed everything he could give to me from, from a leadership perspective. And one thing people always ask, what's the number one thing you learned from Truett while you were meeting with him? And I said, he sold me chicken from the time <laughs> we started the meeting until the time we finished the meeting. <laughs> that's called focus, baby. That's, right. that's one goal, one goal. <laughs> that's exactly right. He knows, look, he was... He pushed the Chick-fil-A motto, Chick-fil-A brand, Chick-fil-A chicken on me the entire time. The Christian and, chicken. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I learned something from that, right? He got to where he is because he lived and breathed his mission. And that was sell the best chicken and provide the best service. And he did it. And so when you talk about leadership lessons and things, uh, I've been really blessed to, to be around some pretty amazing leaders. And I try and grab a little bit from each one that I have the opportunity to meet with. And there's always some lesson that you can grab and say, wow, that's, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to hold on to that. And uh, I think the most important thing, we talk about things that I've learned that I apply to this. I go back to when I was 10 years old. Uh, my dad was a football coach and we were trying to learn an offense and apply it to our little 11 and 12 year old football team. And so our head coach, Mike Bruno, calls what was considered the best football coach in the state that ran that offense. He called him and said, hey, would you teach me how to run the Veer option? 
And this was back in the early 80s. Hmm. And so this head coach drives 30 minutes away to our neighborhood. And we go to the ballpark. And he starts to tell us how we're going to do the veer option and how the quarterbacks make the reads. And this is how you do it. And these are the plays. And, and I was there, not, re- not even on that team yet. Next year, I was going to be on the team. But my older brother was there. And I remember the head coach, our head coach, Mike, looking at Coach J.T. Curtis. He's a legend in the football world. And saying, JT, there's no way an 11 and a 12 year old is going to get this. It's too complicated. The reads are too tough. And JT looks at Mike and says, Listen, you've got it all backwards. He said, What do you mean? He said, Kids will rise to your expectations. If you expect them to make the read, they'll make the read. If you expect them to make the pitch, they'll make the pitch. You give them high expectations and they will rise to your expectations. And then I ended up going to that high school and playing for him. And he is the winningest active football coach in the history of the sport. Still coaching. He's in his early 70s. And what an amazing man that I had the opportunity and the privilege to to serve under as as a player. And I never forgot that lesson. And I've applied it over and over. When I was a coach, I applied it as a coach. Now as a leader and in an organization, I apply it to everyone on my staff. And I, I also learned that, you know, people like to carry weight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They don't want to, they don't want to walk around aimlessly and not having any responsibility. They want responsibility. They want to help and carry things. And so you put the weight on them and let them carry it. And you know, that that's outstanding. I've heard you say three things. One is ask the question, why me? Uh, why here? Why now? Um, I love what you said in reflection on your conversation with Truett, uh, where the fact is, is he lived and breathed his mission. That's the second thing that that I heard you say. And and the and this last one that we're talking about right now, where uh, when you're talking about football and the kids making the reads, that uh, kids will rise to your expectations. I, I just put an exclamation mark on that because I know in my own life and in my own experience, that not only will people rise to a high bar, they will also fall to a low bar. Right. And and what happens is when the leader gets tired, there's a tendency for him or her to naturally lower the standards uh, because they're trying to take a breather or they're exhausted or they're not sure if it's worth it or all of those self-defeating ideas that we sometimes get. But the, the, the penalty for that is it drops the performance, the vision, the passion, the alignment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and I, I just, I just want to just give you a, you know, a virtual high five on that because I do believe that this is true. I experienced it in my own life. Now I did have people complain when the bar was high, but that in itself was a way i know this sounds brutal but that in itself was kind of a washing machine in our culture where those who wanted to be on that kind of team they loved it they stayed with it they did rise to the occasion right and it cleaned out some of those that would rather rather not um and I thought to myself, and I, and I would even rationalize sometimes, you know, I would, I would misuse the word grace. And, and so in, 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 the, in the name of grace, I would lower the bar, not really being self-aware to know that really what I was doing is I did not take care of myself. Um, I would, and I got emotionally exhausted and lowered the bar and let basically let all the bad guys in and uh that's that's one way to say it so that's really good all three of those are really good your first one has to do with recognizing and believing that god is always involved in our lives and so that we need to pay attention to it like one of my favorite uh, uh, mentors you know blackaby says that god is always working and so the idea is to is to notice where he's working and join him in that 